November 13th, 2015. A tragic date that marks French history. 130 dead and 352 injured, the victims of a meticulously prepared terrorist attack by the Islamic State group. Their targets, a football match, a rock concert, and cafe terraces, places of kinship and diversity, where young French people gather, regardless of their origins or beliefs. How do we explain such a deadly downward spiral? After months of investigation, we meet some of those who've returned from Syria, initially seduced by a murderous ideology. Sharing their stories puts these men and women in danger, so we've hidden their identities. Sami is one of them, a 26-year-old Frenchman who thought about joining the military before embracing a radical vision of Islam. If I hear that a bomb goes off and that there are four or five dead, 120 wounded, I'm not going to be happy about it, but I won't be shocked. Even if I don't agree with it, even if deep down it bothers me, I'm not going to show my sadness just because it's a Muslim who did that. Even if I don't agree with him, I'll support him if necessary. It's really stupid. From the moment where you've done that, you're there, violence becomes commonplace. Afterwards, you start watching videos. Then you go further in the frenzy, especially if there are people around. You watch videos published on jihadi platforms, and around us we make jokes. Did you see? So there might be a throat slitting, and we don't care. It's like, oh, did you see that? Look at how he had his throat slit. It becomes commonplace, in fact. From then on, we're ready, ready for an economy-class flight to wherever. Terrorism and indiscriminate violence that seems far removed from our modern world. Farad Kozrokova, an internationally renowned researcher and sociologist, is a reference for those who wish to understand radicalization and jihadist movements. Killing in the name of jihad, it's a vision that we cannot understand because it means in the name of religion. But we're in a very secularized country, a society that's mature enough, we believe, to manage itself without God. We don't need God to manage a society. Abdelali Mamoun is one of the few imams preaching an Islam compatible with Republican values. Every Saturday morning, the theologist takes questions from listeners who are tuned into the radio show Islam Today in a bid to counter extremist ideas. Terrorism didn't begin with the attacks. It started earlier, when indoctrinations started happening in an anarchic way in religious places on the Internet. We've let young people become completely conditioned contaminated by ideals. Their interpretation comes from our guidelines, our sources of Islam, our references, our writings, which are the Quran and the prophetic tradition. Dozens and dozens of mosques are today managed by people who have extremist ideas that are completely incompatible with the Republican values. I'm rising up against this Algerian, Moroccan or Turkish or whatever intrusion in France. In our mosques today, there are imams who have come from these countries and don't have the French mentality, who don't know anything about French culture or French laws, and who are meant to look after our believers, our youth. Like Imam Abdelali Mamoun, anthropologist Dunya Buzar has condemned the rise of radicalization for many years. She was one of the first in France to react to the wave of young people setting off for Syria. It's a totalitarian project, if we want to define it, in the sense that it's in the name of an ideology which seeks to exterminate all those who do not share this truth. But at the same time, we have the wider use of Islam that follows the norms shared by all Muslims, so we have a mix of styles never seen before. 
And the Internet means this can extend everywhere. If we don't undertake a thorough analysis of this indoctrination, we can't fight it. If you don't have the right diagnosis, you won't find the cure. In France, more than 11,700 people are known to be involved in the Syrian conflict. Authorities keep tabs on them at a local level via the police. Anti-radicalization cells centralize all the information gathered by toll-free hotlines, the police, and the National Department for Education. We were granted exceptional permission to attend one of these meetings. We've got a new alert of someone who has dropped out from the professional project he was working on with his sister. He doesn't want to work on it as he thinks money is dirty. He brings up the theory of a conspiracy for recent attacks and has talked about Mohamed Mera, and he has spent his evenings on websites. So it's a situation that could be worrying indeed. It's a situation the police has identified and is being processed by intelligence services. There are no special measures laid out for the moment anyway. Nothing for you? This meeting is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the fight against terrorism. A top secret unit of specialist police officers investigates day and night. On the ground, the police work with a sprawling network of informants. Major Bruno Vasseur is on the hunt for so-called weak signals. We try to inform ourselves via schools, mosques, amongst the population. We have contacts in council estates, and we always let the hierarchy know, and we advise the relevant authorities. What do you mean by saying she wants to go to Syria? Did you hear her say that? No. She told me she wanted to leave, and I haven't seen her for a while. I don't know whether she's gone or not. I don't know where she is. It's strange. What did she say? Did she say anything anti-Republican? What did she say to you in particular? She told me she wanted to join in with that thing, the Islamic State, Jihad, to take part in all that. Okay. Okay, thank you. If you have any other information like that, then please call straight away. I think there are a lot of delinquents or petty criminals who won't shoot people. Not everyone's a killer. They're very psychologically weak, like they've been manipulated by a guru. That's the impression that I get. But what does the Islamic State organization offer them? Well, it offers them a sort of rite of passage from teenage years to adulthood by way of heroism, war, confronting death. Everything that could get you out of a daily routine that would be considered morose by middle classes. For working classes or youth who feel left out, obviously things seem a bit different. These people feel like they've never been part of society for the past 20 years. They nourish a sort of hatred for society. In fact, we can see this dimension I call anti-May 1968, when youth wanted to make love, not war, but now it's make war, not love. When they go to Syria? Of course, yes. They used to go to Afghanistan, Kathmandu, Nepal, to smoke, party, etc. But now it's no longer parties, it's war. Sometimes it might be a party within the war, yes, but at the same time, it's war and extreme violence. And these youth, especially from suburbs and low-income neighborhoods, they used to be judged, condemned, imprisoned. But now they're the ones who are judging. They're the ones condemning this society they see as heretic, full of infidels. And so they're ready to unleash an incredible level of violence against ordinary citizens. Tasked by the French Interior Ministry, 
Dunya and her team have developed methods that have prevented the departure of more than 200 youths. They also deal with those that have escaped from Syria. Like Sarah, a 20-year-old medical student. She was detained in inhumane conditions and refused to marry a French jihadist. He told me he was going to take me to his sisters and they would talk to me and teach me Akhida, the truth, that they'll teach me the religion. They asked why I came and I said to immigrate. That's the main goal, to satisfy God, not a man. So one of them said that I was a spy from Mossad. Another said, you're a spy sent from Lebanon. I was called a spy from so many countries. So then I thought, oh, this isn't funny anymore. I started begging and cried. They aimed a gun at me. They stripped me naked, but I had a towel on me. I had just come out of the shower. They took it off. They put a Q-tip in my vagina to see if I had a microphone there. I felt humiliated. One of them snapped out of it for 10 seconds and said, imagine this, girls. If this isn't true, what we're putting her through for nothing. That lasted 10 seconds, so I started to have hope. I thought, ah, oh, thank you, it's okay. She's starting to see straight. Then she said, but anyway, even if it is for nothing, this is just a test from Allah for her. But one of them said, girls, if she's a spy, I'm going to ask Dwala. If I can kill her straight away, I'll make a video and kill her. It was over. You weren't a human anymore. She didn't feel anything. She could kill you. They were in heaven. They were saying things like, imagine, girls, if I'm right, if I make the video. That's how they were. I shut up and waited for the secret police. You stopped everything. Yep. They opened the cell and I went in. I was back in my cell and I thought, here I am, I'm going to die. And sometimes I pretended to be really, really ill. In the beginning, they didn't want to take me to the hospital until I made up a huge lie. So they would take me. It was a glimmer of hope the whole time. So they took me to the hospital. They took me through the city. I saw heads stuck on spikes. I saw them all swollen. They turned black, and then I thought, damn, really? Where am I? I wasn't scared of death anymore, of being killed by them, so I thought, I need to save myself. Even if I'm caught, I need to save myself. Sarah is one of the few women who managed to return to France. But she's been indicted for conspiring with a terrorist organization for having joined the Islamic State group. The judges consider that women do not participate in combat, so Sarah is free to join Dunya's team and share her experience. This is in a bid to prevent other women from leaving. Today, they're faced with an urgent case. Alice is a mother to an eight-year-old son, and they're about to go to Syria. Why does the Islamic State group have so much appeal for Alice? Why does she believe in it? What illusions does she get from it? Why does it reassure her? Why does it take authority over her? It's like with someone who needs alcohol and finds all the little corner shops shut. That person will go to great lengths to find alcohol. When we need people, people who look out for you and your family, People who love you? When you feel love, yes, you can go to great lengths. When you're in it, does it mean that you feel right away that you need others, right away? Immediately, you need them all the time? Yeah, it's something you've never felt before. So when you feel it, it's as if you were born again. It's a rebirth to find a new family. For sure. A new birth. A new birth and a new family. That's intense what you're saying. And what if you had had a child, a boy? Can you imagine that? Yes, I can imagine. And even with a son, I would want him to feel this love from the start. I would want him to get this love right away. I would want him to be glorified and never left alone. What you're telling me is that this woman dies with her son because she's looking for love? Yes. Alice stayed at home in France, but how many more French women have fallen into an IS recruiter's trap? On the Turkish-Syrian border, Nourdin, a Swiss national of Moroccan origin, is searching for his brother who was recruited by the IS group. 
Aware that his sibling is not an isolated case, he's decided to stay on with the hope of saving the lives of others. Indeed, I know lots of French people who want to come home and who made the mistake of going to Syria. They get in touch via private and encrypted communication methods. They tell me what it's like there and how they were tricked, how they were recruited, how they were misled by the images they were shown of the ground. It's a state like Hitler's, like the Nazis, in fact. All those who don't fit their model, those who don't fit the robotic framework of what they want, and even if you're not a spy, as long as you aren't exactly what they want, a good fighter, a slave, they'll put you in prison, they'll separate you from friends, take away your phone. It's really a sect you join but can't leave. If you leave, you get killed. Their spokesperson, El Rudnami, said that those who want to leave will be shot in the head. That's clear. The Islamic State group, what are they hiding if they refuse to let people leave? I'm doing this because this is a collective necessity, as a Muslim, but also because people die there. Nordine is in contact with Anna, a 17-year-old French woman who wants to flee Raqqa, the capital of the Islamic State group. Putting her life at risk, Anna alerts young girls who dream of marrying an IS jihadist. The person who recruited me was young. I believed everything he said to me. He told me, life's great over there. They give you houses, they give you salaries, they give you money, a thousand dollars when you get married. You can buy whatever you want. Life's great, it's really wonderful. In the end, I was married for three days and then I had to get a divorce. You know, it was really tough for me. Men can divorce the women, or they just get married, take three women and even slaves. It was really hard. I made the biggest mistake of my life, and I just hope others aren't going to do the same. There are a lot of us here who want to go home, but we can't. The town's under surveillance, everything's controlled, the roads. If you want to leave, then you're going to have a lot of problems. Today, there are over 550 French citizens in Syria, more than any other European country to have answered the call of the Islamic State group. Those who return to France end up behind bars. The authorities fear these people could be ordered to carry out terror attacks. Mehdi, a 21-year-old Frenchman, joined the militant group the Al Nusra Front in 2013. While in Syria, he found that he couldn't deal with the war or violence against women and children. He is now awaiting trial and faces up to 10 years in jail. Like other reformed convicts, he shares his cell with a radicalized inmate. Yeah, I told the penitentiary system that I'm not dangerous. I told them I came back because I just wanted to leave all that behind me. But they didn't take what I said into account, and they left me with the same person, someone radicalized. He was talking to me all the time about jihad and the Islamic State group. Restrictions during the day, not allowed to listen to music or watch telly. They impose their way of life. It's the feeling of being alone with these people, of being abandoned. No one is listening. That's what creates terrorists, not prison itself. None of the de-radicalization we talk about in France has actually happened. More than 150 French youths are in custody. While awaiting trial, which won't take place for another two years, will they manage to resist the small caliphates that are developing in French prisons? We need a security response to terrorism, because terrorism kills. It kills. So we need a security response. But the justice system's responsibility goes beyond that. It must make sure that we tear people who are tempted away from it, and that those who are already involved in it, give them a way to get out of it. The interest of society is not that these people fall into a deeper bitterness nor hate nor marginalization. That isn't of interest to society. What we have experimented in double separation, 
not regrouping, a double separation, a separation with respect to the penal population, to avoid any influence on this population. One of the first effects was to lower tensions, notably in the Fren prison. The other separation is to make sure they aren't together. They aren't sat together plotting. They're separated in individual cells. Yet the official line is at odds with reality. Overcrowded prisons and lengthy legal proceedings show that justice is lagging behind in the fight against terrorism, while each inmate is a ticking time bomb. Prison can have a negative effect. It can create hardened jihadists, people who used to be undecided, traumatized or even repentant. If we deal with the situation reasonably, the probability that a large part of youth will not become jihadists is high. It's also an act of blind faith. We need to do it with precision, but without being sure of the result. But one thing that we can be sure of is that prison sees a much higher percentage turned into hardened jihadists than amongst people outside. In Denmark, the UK and the Netherlands, the justice system has more resources, with some cities running de-radicalization and vocational rehabilitation programs. European institutions encourage all EU member states to make this their priority. Most of the perpetrators of terror attacks have spent time behind bars. For Mera, I believe it all happened in prison. You don't know what happens when you're in prison. You don't know what they're doing to foreigners, Muslims, how they treat us, and in particular Muslims. We are proud men. That's what we have in common. We are very proud of our religion. You know what? You can insult me, but you can't insult my religion. In addition to the threat of what are often called lone wolves, such as Mohammed Mera, are threats from those who've trained in Syria and who've been instructed to strike on French soil. You're imams in the mosques, you need to clean things up. We don't know religion, we don't even know how to talk to our young people. You're imams, you're on the front line, you're like doctors, like the army. It's up to you to say stop. Sorting this out needs to begin in the mosques, I'm sorry, but with my respect. But the mosques aren't managed by French imams, they're managed from abroad, by Rabat, Algiers, Istanbul, that's the problem. We're held hostage, I'm a pariah. I've changed mosques so many times because of my Republican discourse. How do we talk to our children? Join us in this fight. For months, the imam has asked authorities for help, to have the means to hit back at IS propaganda and to stop foreign countries from interfering. But France is walking on eggshells, careful not to upset its economic and diplomatic partners Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Algeria, Morocco and Turkey. The terrorists know how to take advantage of Western democracies and their vulnerabilities. Let's not fall into a war of civilizations. The first to be killed are Sunnis. They kill people like them because they don't want to pledge allegiance. It has to be said and said again. They want us to think it is a war of civilizations. Because if we say that, we'll talk about the Middle Eastern Christians, Yazidis, but not about the Muslims they've killed. That way people will turn against Islam, and the more they turn against Islam, and the greater discrimination and stigmatization against Muslims, the easier it will be to say, you see, there's a plot against you. They'll never let you be Muslims in the West because they know you know the truth. They know you are superior, so they want to get rid of you, so you should kill them. So there you go. It means there is greater paranoia, and that's useful to them. It needs to be reminded that they also and above all kill Muslims, five-year-old children at point-blank range. We have these testimonies from young people who've returned. And these are the people who save the lives of those who want to leave today. If Sami let go of his death wish, if Sarah cut all ties with the IS group, if Mehdi walked away from the Al Nusra front, and if Anna was able to flee Raqqa, it's only thanks to the people they were lucky enough to meet, such as lawyers or mentors. But what can be done to ensure those behind bars 
and those who feel hatred for France do not embark on the same path. The programmes and facilities are there, from neighbourhood associations to educators who took up their anti-radicalisation battle long before the Paris terror attacks. All that remains is to finally provide them with a real means to act.